The essence of demand pull inflation is too much money chasing too few goods. And that is exactly what happened when the U.S. tried to finance both guns and butter, both the Vietnam War and the Great Society. This situation is illustrated in this figure. During wartime, increased defense spending moves aggregate demand from AD to AD prime, and equilibrium output increases from E to E prime as real GDP expands. However, when real output rises far above potential output, the price level moves up sharply as well, from P to P prime. In 1972, President Richard Nixon imposed price and wage controls and gained the nation a brief respite from the Johnson era inflation. However, once the controls were lifted in 1973, inflation jumped back up to double digits, helped in large part by a different kind of inflation than emerging, an inflation known as cost push or supply side inflation. Cost push or supply side inflation occurs when factors such as rapid increases in raw material prices or wage increases drive up production costs. This can happen as a result of so-called supply shocks such as those experienced in the early 1970s. During this period, such shocks included crop failures, a worldwide drought, and a quadrupling of the world price of crude oil. This cost push situation in the 1970s is illustrated in this figure. Sharply higher oil, commodity, and labor costs increase the cost of doing business. In the ASAD framework, the higher costs shift the AS curve up from AS to AS prime, and the equilibrium shifts from E to E prime. Output declines from Q to Q prime while prices rise. This leads to the phenomenon of stagflation, recession or stagnation combined with inflation. In this situation, the economy suffers the double whammy of both lower output and higher prices. Prior to the 1970s, economists didn't believe you could even have both high inflation and high unemployment at the same time. If one went up, the other had to go down. The 1970s proved economists wrong on this point and likewise exposed Keynesian economics as being incapable of solving the new stagnation problem. Keynesian dilemma was simply this, using expansionary policies to reduce unemployment simply created more inflation, while using contractionary policies to curb inflation only deepened the recession. That meant that the traditional Keynesian tools could solve only half of the stagflation problem at any one time, and only by making the other half worse. It was this inability of Keynesian economics to cope with stagflation that set the stage for Professor Milton Friedman's monetarist challenge to what had become the Keynesian orthodoxy. Milton Friedman's monetarist school argued that the problems of both inflation and recession may be traced to one thing, the rate of growth of the money supply. To the monetarists, inflation happens when the government prints too much money, and recessions happen when it prints too little. From this monetarist perspective, stagflation is the inevitable result of activist fiscal and monetary policies that try to push the economy beyond its so-called natural rate of unemployment, or more technically, its lowest sustainable unemployment rate. This natural rate of unemployment, or LSUR, is the lowest level of unemployment that can be attained without upward pressure on inflation. According to the monetarist, expansionary attempts to go beyond this lowest sustainable unemployment rate may result in short-run spurts of growth. However, after each growth spurt, prices and wages rise and drag the economy back to its LSUR, albeit at a higher rate of inflation. Over time, these futile attempts to push the economy beyond its lowest sustainable unemployment rate 
lead to an upward inflationary spiral. In this situation, monetarists believe that the only way to wring inflation and inflationary expectations out of the economy is to have the actual unemployment rate rise above the LSUR. And that means only one thing, inducing a recession. This is at least one interpretation of what the Federal Reserve did beginning in 1979 under the monetarist banner of setting monetary growth targets. Under Chairman Paul Volcker, the Fed adopted a sharply contractionary monetary policy and interest rates soared to over 20 percent. Particularly hard hit were interest-sensitive sectors of the economy like housing construction, automobile purchases, and business investment. While the Fed's bitter medicine worked, three years of hard economic times left a bitter taste in the mouths of the American people, now hungry for a sweeter macroeconomic cure than either the Keynesians or monetarists could offer. Enter stage right, supply-side economics. <laughs>